Hello. Hey, how's it going? Good. How are you? How's my sound? Can you hear me? Yeah, you sound fine. Awesome. It's Carter, right? Yeah. Nice to meet you. I'm Zeke. Nice to meet you, too. I'm really excited for this. I, I loved your role in the game, and I'm, I'm just so happy to be able to do this interview. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> this is your first one, right? Uh, it's, it's my first full one. Um, mm -hmm. I, I interviewed, uh, Bruce Campbell was my, like, first ever one, and, uh, but that was, like, a paid, like, I paid for, like, a Comic-Con event, it was, like, a video call, and I just yeah. used that time for an interview, and, okay. uh, then I did Jason Spizak the same way, just with some more time, and mm -hmm. then, um, th this is my first one that's, like, I did it the right way, the, the professional way, and I'm really excited about it. Awesome. This should be fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, there we go. All right. So I just want to start with, uh, you mentioned in the Callisto Protocol docuseries, of course, that everyone in the experience uh, has a form of relatability. Uh, so what did you do to help Elias be such a relatable character? Um... You may have heard this before. I, uh, I think acting is acting. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what the medium is. So um, <clears throat> as an actor, once you understand the technical aspects of the medium in which you're working, whether that be stage or on screen or in a video game, the rest of it is really down to inhabiting a character and doing a good enough job acting that people believe what you're doing in an unbelievable situation. Okay. Um, everybody has their method of how they get into that. Um, <clears throat> mine, particularly for this character, um, is a lot of personal experience mm -hmm. um, because that is real. And it is, it is something that I can lean on and never goes away. So to be able to bring aspects of who I am and people who are very close to me into building a character, I think allows that, that character to be relatable. That's awesome. No, that makes perfect sense. Uh, I, I agree the same way. Like, it shouldn't... There's a lot of actors that I've seen that try to go into video games, like, like higher roles. I've seen, you know, Keanu Reeves did Cyberpunk, and he fit right in, but then there are some, other, uh, some others that treat it like it's different, and the role feels mm -hmm. different, and you can kind of tell that. But, uh, no, your role was absolutely and extremely relatable, and you did a fantastic job uh thank um, you of course uh so what was it like to work with striking distance and crafton uh as well as you know fellow actors uh well the crafton part's easy i have no idea because i've never met any of them uh, <laughs> <laughs> they're a korean-based company mm -hmm. and we filmed this game the ports that the, the portion of photography that was filmed mm -hmm. was during the pandemic ah so for the entire first year, I hadn't actually even met anyone from striking distance in person. Wow. Um, the way they set it up, the way this worked was we did auditions over, uh, first auditions were self tapes sent in. Mm. Uh, and then callbacks and stuff were done on sort of live eco cast or zoom sessions where I could see uh, the creative folks and talk to them, but mm. we weren't in the same room. And so then you get cast and they decided to uh, do their motion capture, their performance capture, excuse me, at the uh, performance capture stage that Sony owns in Santa Monica. So we would show up to that stage, uh, of course, with all of the COVID precautions in place. And we'd walk in and the stage, the minimum stage personnel would be there to run the stage. And those are the folks that work for the Sony stage. Mm -hmm. And everyone else from striking distance was sort of like the voice of God coming <laughs> through the speakers. Um, and after a while, you get to understand whose voice is whose when they're talking to you. But it was just us as the actors in the playground with the techs. Um, we'd have a motion capture director there, but the game director, the producer, the writer, um, the creative director were all just sort of piped in for the entire first year. Um, and then magically, as thing we got to, you know, the, the pandemic started to come down a little bit and we started to understand things a little better we finally got the striking distance folks in the room, mm -hmm. only four of them. Uh, <laughs> but, but it was very important to have the dialogue coordinator there, to have the director there, to have the producers there, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> because there's nothing like making it in the room. Mm -hmm. um, 
Now I will say about them, they are some, uh, Striking Distance is a new studio, mm -hmm. but it's made up of heavyweights from the industry. Mm -hmm. um, they come from, you know, Dead Space, they come from Call of Duty, they come from God of War, they come from all of these massive franchises. This is a very small industry, so they know what they're doing. Right. Um, and I do want to say this particular um, game was unlike any other game I've done in that uh, Scott and Chris uh, and Eric and Justin, the team that were there directing us, allowed us a great deal of freedom to bring what we wanted to the character, um, which is not always what you get. Sometimes it's, hey, there's your line, say the line on the, on the page yeah. the way I wrote it. Um, particularly with this character of Elias, because he was not written um, as an English character. Mm -hmm. um, myself, growing up in England, English people, they speak a different way. There's a different sense of slang. They organize their words in a different manner. And, and we got to the point where they were like, as long as you hit the main points, like he's got to get to the tower and he's got to go there, just do what you would do. Yeah. Um, which is an incredible amount of freedom for a directing team to give you. And, and it's something that I think we were all appreciative. Um, so that's the striking distance team. Mm -hmm. Awesome, awesome team to work with. Um, my fellow actors, <laughs> um, I will say I was nervous yeah. going in uh, because in video games, you're generally on your own. You don't generally share the space with your other actors. And, and oftentimes when you do, it's not movie stars that mm -hmm. are coming in. Um, I myself am a massive fan of Josh and Karen and Sam. Um, so to be able to work with them was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. um, what's interesting is uh, everybody's heard like the, the stories of method actors and, and all the craziness and stuff like that they can go on on set. Mm -hmm. uh, my approach as an actor to that is to find out what my scene partners do as a process and see if I can fit with that. Mm -hmm. uh, for this particular game, that was so easy. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll start with Josh. Let me know if I rambled too much. Oh, you're totally fine. Yeah. I can talk about this stuff all day. I love <laughs> it. If you can't tell. Um, <laughs> so Josh was sort of, we were all given sort of carte blanche uh, at jump to take the script and make it our own. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the ways in which Josh works as an actor is very off the cuff. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you're not good at improv, that can be daunting. Um, I have an improv background, so that was a lot of fun because, again, you got to make the character whatever you wanted it to be. Mm -hmm. Every take is different. You never know what's coming. And again, that, that sense of doing it in the moment um, really helps the realism because, mm -hmm. you know, if you're confused, it's because you were actually confused. You weren't ready for what they had to say at that moment. Um, but also even though that sort of approach to acting can be daunting, if you have a very giving actor mm -hmm. like Josh is and somebody who is a lot of fun, it becomes a blast. Mm -hmm. um, here's a little secret about being on set. The tone is generally set by number one on the call sheet. Mm -hmm. And what that means is you get a call sheet of who's going to work that day and you have all of your actors. Well, there's somebody who's listed first and it's always the lead. And mm -hmm. this goes for uh, TV or film or video games. Um, and that person tends to set the energy and tone of the set. Mm. Um, it is a very large responsibility. Um, but Josh would walk in every morning going, we're making games! <laughs> or, you know, we'd have a particularly hard scene and we'd be, we'd be doing some difficult stuff and he'd just stop and go, we're making games here, we're having fun. <laughs> and it may seem silly, but that is such a big thing because you all get really scope locked on the problem and on the scene mm -hmm. and, and to have your leader um, the director is the leader, but your number one on the call sheet is also a leader to be able to sort of bring everybody around and go, hey, man, nobody put a gun to our head to be here. We all wanted to do this. This is so much fun. Let's really enjoy it. it was really awesome to be around. And that sort of that atmosphere and that attitude just sort of filtered through everybody and, and really made the, the set experience a ton of fun. Yeah. Um, I was intimidated to work with Karen because Kimiko. Yeah. Like who wouldn't? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she is impressive in so many ways as an actor, as a voice actor, as a mover, as a martial artist. Um, 
I don't I don't think I'm giving any uh, secrets away by saying she is absolutely nothing like Kimiko in real life. Uh -huh. She is the nicest person you will <laughs> ever meet. Uh, incredibly talented and tons of fun to work with. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think this was her first time doing performance capture, mm -hmm. but to see her just attack it and learn it so quick sort of made me humbled. I was like, I've spent years learning how to do this and you did, uh, okay, all right, <laughs> lesson learned. Um, and then Sam, Sam is, uh, Sam is an exercise in sort of like acting class. Mm -hmm. uh, as an actor, I, he goes so deep. Mm -hmm. Um, it's really fun to watch. And his take on the character was not what I expected it to be. Um, he came in smiling and smug and charming. And I was like, well, that doesn't really look the way the character was written on the page. And in the first scene, I was like, man, that's, <laughs> that's I love, I, I need more Ferris. And even after yeah. playing the game, I'm like, I want some more Ferris, man. Yeah. Um, it, it ended in a way where it felt like we could get more Ferris, like, like the, cause I, I noticed that right at the end, it, the way she's, it interrupts with the jump scare, that was Ferris's model. So yeah, I, I yeah. it made me think, it also made me think about your character because most of the game, Elias is telling you how your core is going to mess with your head, especially if it's new. So it, so w the way it ended like that, I'm sure a lot of people just skipped over it as like, oh, that's a jump scare. But when I noticed it was Ferris, I was like, wait a minute, like how much of what I just did was in my head and how much of that was like, like is <laughs> I'm really excited for the DLC because that'll like make me figure that out, you know? So hopefully, or maybe it'll just take you further down. the. Oh yeah, no, road. I'm going to, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, go ahead. Sorry. I, I was just like, clearing my Oh, no. <laughs> uh, I think that was it. So the, the interesting thing about this game is it's such a small cast. Mm -hmm. So most of the times when I was on set, it was just me and Josh mm -hmm. or me and Josh and Karen or me and Josh and Sam. But there weren't really a lot of days where there was a lot of us there. Mm -hmm. um, let me take that back because I am disrespecting the stunt performers. Mm -hmm. Anytime you make a performance capture video game, it doesn't matter that I'm the face and the voice and the cinematic movement. There is an army of men and women who do the uh, specialized movement and stunts mm -hmm. um, that is probably a larger portion of the work than the stuff that we do. Um, and those guys are awesome. <laughs> awesome. One of our guys, uh, Kyle Soderman, is like a finalist for Ninja Warrior mm -hmm. and a, like a, a, a parkour expert. Um, Nick Verdi, Omar Zaki, these dudes like can do things that sort of, you know, everybody thinks they're pretty athletic. And then you see some stunt performers do some stuff and you're like, yeah, I'm going to go back to the couch. I'm good. <laughs> I'm, I'm good. So, yeah. So that's what it was like working with everybody. That's awesome. Um. Has the experience uh, such as this game, you know, because uh, I know that you've worked with other games. You've worked with uh, Cold War, Vanguard, like uh, there are some really reputable games under your belt. But I know that the Callisto Protocol is a very unique one uh, compared to most games. And has this game encouraged you to encounter more uh, horror games in the future or sci-fi games in the future? I know they're developing a new uh, Aliens game. That's going to be like a single player marine environment. And then the uh, um, Quiet Place game is deep in development right now. So there's a lot of different games that have really cool franchise opportunities. Has this game kind of opened the door for you to see the opportunities in those? Not so much opened the door as in solidified my love of gaming. Mm -hmm. Um I play all kinds of games. I, I tend to stick with plot-driven narrative games a lot. But as a game performer, it's sort of on me to know everything that's out there. Um, <clears throat> and I've been a gamer my whole life. So, you know, I loved Alien Isolation. Mm -hmm. I like the super massive games that basically choose your own adventure films like The Quarry and Until Dawn. Mm -hmm. And um, I put Outlast down because it scared the ever-living <laughs> out of me uh just the you know 
uh, I don't know what it was about the game. I, I have a specific way that I play scary games, and that one just really ruined me. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was it? There was a. Uh, I, I've tried some VR horror games. Uh, they don't work for me. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, I, I really like the genre. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember the original Resident Evil group of games. Mm-hmm. And they were so awesome and so cool in setting that tone and mood. And like game sequels do, as they went along, they built on the mechanic and they made things better and it got prettier. And it got, uh, despite the fact that you cannot uh, repeat horror, like once you've been scared by something, you're not scared by it anymore. Mm -hmm. They still created such a a good immersive world that I wanted to be in. Right. Um, And... uh, Callisto Protocol was a little bit scary because it's a new thing Mm -hmm. and people don't like change, myself included. Mm -hmm. Uh, And when we first started talking about it, hearing the fact that this was a survival horror that was melee based, Mm -hmm. it's like, I don't know, it's not going to work. What's that? Um, You need your gun, man. You need, you need a gun. Like it was such a bold choice Mm -hmm. and I think it works. And, And I know that you're trying to reprogram many, many years of how gamers do things. There are certain things that all gamers understand, Mm -hmm. you know, like left stick, right stick, right? Left stick, move, right stick, look, Mm -hmm. or right stick, move, left stick, look. Um, That is sort of a a standard. Mm -hmm. And it is the standard in shooter games to have a certain thing. And this sort of took you away from it. And I like that in the progression of the game, you don't even get the gun until a couple hours in. Right which is supposed to tell you this is not a gun-based game, but me, like everyone else, got the gun and is like, please on everything! And then all of a sudden I'm completely out of bullets. Mm -hmm. And after dying a bunch of times, I realized that, okay, maybe, oh, maybe them giving me the melee weapon at the beginning was a hint that I should lead with that. Mm -hmm. Um, So I I learned slow, but I learned. (laughs) Um, And I really like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I, I, you know, the more time I spend with it, the more I enjoy. I I totally botched the whole gun thing. I I went straight melee most of the game. The only time I cared about the gun was the boss fight, uh, the final mm-hmm. boss with Ferret. Because that, dear God, if I didn't get the skunk gun upgraded as much as I could, I was going to be stuck there for the rest of my life. There's and that was on e that was like on the medium difficulty. That wasn't even on max. That was uh, which I appreciate that as a game because. Uh, there's a lot of games like Dark Souls and stuff like that where, like, going into it, it sucks. Like, it's the hardest thing in the world. (laughs) You're gonna die a lot, and it sucks. This game is... The thing that I compared it to in my review was um, Doom. Uh, Doom Eternal Mm -hmm. was built on the aspect of we don't want everyone to just get the rocket launcher and then use it the whole game like they did in the last game. Uh, Mm -hmm. so they made it so each weapon has a purpose and they made it so it's a learning curve because each demon did something different. And while the enemy variety isn't crazy in this game, I loved that the, that the, you still had to use melee on like 90% of the fights. Like you had to make sure that you were using it because it was the strongest tool you had. The guns were just a help, but, Mm -hmm. but you needed the melee and that was really awesome. I think that was like everybody's favorite thing after the game had gotten a bit fixed, because I know a lot of people hated the game just because they couldn't run it at first. But mm-hmm. yeah, it, and it, it fits with it fits with the story. Mm-hmm. Um, we're so used to myself included playing um, games like this as the super expert special forces gears of war like mm-hmm. badass person. Um, Jacob is a space trucker. Yeah. You know, he's not he's not the kind of guy that's going to nail the center of a target at 30 yards away with a pistol. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because unlike TV, no one makes that shot in real life. Yeah. You know, outside of 10 yards, you're not hitting anything with a pistol unless you're very well trained. So I kind of like that. And my second my second playthrough is max difficulty. And it's um, it's almost entirely melee based based because I want to get to the point where I can get the assault rifle and then just sort of mow down Ferris at the end. Yeah. That's that's my goal. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. There's so many good things about it um, because I like new and I, I, you know, 
I'm resistant to change like anyone else is, but man, isn't it cool to, to do something new and original and, and really enjoy it? Yeah. Um, so I appreciate that. Yeah, of course. Um, in the docuseries, you implied uh, at the end of the last episode that, of course, you're going to play through the whole game and uh, multiple times. And as I'm doing the same, as you just said, you're doing a playthrough on max difficulty. I'm doing the same. Um, what are your thoughts in terms of how the game ran? You know, like how, how your first experience was and then going through it a second time. Uh, what was the experience for you and watching how your character's arc went through? So I, um, I play survival horror games a very specific way. Mm -hmm. And it's the same way that I used to watch um, movies on Halloween. So I wait until it's night. Mm -hmm. I shut off all the lights. I open up the windows. Mm -hmm. And then I put a stereo headset on and I play that way. Mm -hmm. So the first way through, I just played on medium. And it was all about enjoying the experience. Right. Which is even more difficult to do when you know the plot and you've seen the story and you've seen it a great deal of the environment and the artwork. Um, but I am the kind of person that really gets lost in a story. And so I really enjoyed that. Mm. Um, one of the things that I really liked about the game, and I know this is, this is polarizing, is that there is zero HUD. Yes. There is nothing to distract you from being immersed in the environment around you. It does make it difficult because sometimes you get lost. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I tend to approach things in a very methodical manner. And so you eventually get where you need to go. I mean, the game is not, it's not open world. So you're not going to get lost in a corner and never be able to get out. Right. Um, but yeah, so I did that the first time through just to get the whole experience. Um, the second time through, I'm playing a little differently. Like I'm leaning entirely on that stun baton and loving it. Um, I have spent so much time with the characters of, of Jacob and Danny and Elias that I have to remind myself to sort of pay attention to that. I tend to get lost in the world itself. Yeah. Uh, I'm that kind of person that burns extra hours in a game just stopping and looking around at stuff. Because uh, I am the original gaming generation mm -hmm. where it was a block shooting a block at the other block. Right. And how far we've come never ceases to amaze me. Um, so I like to enjoy that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, I love the, um, I love the environment. I, I do love the no HUD completely. Mm -hmm. I like that the health bar is on the back of your neck. Uh, some games should probably learn from that because, yeah. uh, the, I loved alien isolation for the same reason, because the HUD was like barely there. If not there at all, if you were playing on nightmare mode, you were screwed. Because there, no <laughs> there was no HUD, and your motion tracker didn't work, so you're just like, I'm, I'm done. Where are you? I'm not good. Like it was the scariest thing in your life, and that yeah. it made you feel like you were in it. And uh, the Callisto Protocol just fuels that. It takes that and runs with it, and that felt really nice. Um, the only thing that I didn't like about the no HUD was the no map. Because I got lost constantly. I kept going. I, I was looking for secrets. I'm a completionist. I love looking for the little yeah. Easter eggs. And then I got into one room. And I kept going in the same room for like four hours straight. I like looked uh -huh. back on the recording to see how long. And I was in there for four hours. Because I was like, this, this looks so different. But this looks the same. But I'm trusting my gut. And I was so wrong. I like turned to the left once. And I was like, I, I made it. Like, I'm damn it <laughs> but uh, well here's the thing you're you're bound to run into things like that particularly with a new ip and a new mechanic mm -hmm. what i love about video games i love film too because I, I work on on camera as well but what i really love about video games is the sequel always tends to get better in a video game mm -hmm. and that's because what you can do is take the the lessons that you learned like okay well for accessibility, perhaps that HUD needs to be selectable. And you know, it may even, I'm not even sure if it is right now because I know there are accessibility options within the game. Most modern AAA games coming out now have accessibility selectors and I'm not sure if that's in there, but if it's not, that would be great feedback. Mm -hmm. And this developer loves feedback. Mm -hmm. um, they are really good about sort of seeing what worked and what didn't work and tweaking it. They're even, you know, sending out patches to update things within the game now rather yeah. than wait for a sequel. Um, so I think that's really cool. 
Mm. Uh, considering that your character, Elias Porter, spent most of his life within Black Iron Prison, and while he was guiding us through the labyrinth of the prison, uh, we we didn't see you all the time. We heard your voice, yeah. you kept decent communication, but you weren't always there. Uh, and there were a lot of moments in the game where you were radio silent because you were in the middle of something. You you ran, Your character ran into something, so would you think that striking distance would be open or uh should consider any story dlc that's like a prequel or a run-along story of playing as elias and doing doing a separate kind of story as it's going along are you kidding hell i hope so glenn <laughs> are you listening glenn uh <laughs> Yeah, that would be awesome. I, the one thing I, I you know, because I have sat and thought about this, and it's like, it would be really cool to play as Elias. Elias is a better fighter than Jacob. Mm -hmm. or your moveset may be different. Mm -hmm. um, Elias has a, a better knowledge of the, the prison environment. So your environmental kills could be amazing. Mm -hmm. um, likewise, if you were to play as Danny, mm -hmm. Danny could be a weapons expert. Karen is a martial artist. It could be some really interesting tweaks mm -hmm. to the combat that sort of lift and move to the next position as you play with these ancillary characters if they so choose it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's a lot of options there. I, you know, I, would, I love the universe. I would love to come back to it. Um, I, I don't think it's too much of a spoiler to say at this point that we know I won't be in the sequel. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I. I I don't think I reached the ends of who Elias was as a character, and there's so much more to explore. So I would love to to show Elias's journey through the tram and the other parts of Black Iron Prison that are yet unexplored and his approach to it. I think that would be amazing. Right. It'd be even cooler, too, because the biophage, the way that that infection was spreading, it was attacking vital parts of the prison first. You know, the security mm -hmm. system shut down. They They when you see the shoe later in the game, it's way at the end of the game. Like you're close to the end and mm -hmm. it's only just then infected. Like they targeted everything that was uh, vital and considering Elias has such access to like you, you had, you said yourself greater permissions and greater access to the prison than Jacob did because Jacob is a brand new inmate. Mm -hmm. And so seeing other parts of the prison might have more dangerous and uh interesting biophage that are more adapted yeah. to that environment yeah and there's there's opportunity for a new game mechanic uh elias knows how to hack the prison systems what's what's it like if you can hack a security robot right yeah. to work with you instead of having to try and shoot them in that tiny little eyeball oh god that was <laughs> which god. i have yet to successfully do by the way i didn't realize it was the eyeball <laughs> i bet it's like shoot them in the head i was like okay i'll shoot them in the head and then they shoot back and i'm just gone and i'm like okay it was shot him in the head like if it's the eyeball then that makes oh god i should have i'm assuming one. i've never actually killed one i snuck by every single one every time because every time i tried to, to fight them i died in my first playthrough oh, i killed the one that it told me to kill like when it said like he you can kill them you could shoot them in the head i did and i was like yes and then every robot after that i was like i'm gonna do it again and the robot was like no you won't <laughs> just you're done by the way you're done. but um what has to be like outside of the callista protocol what has to be like the best horror franchise or at least video game franchise that you've played through uh oh boy well, I, 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 that's always a tough question. That's like, who's your favorite kid? Um, <laughs> Resident Evil is longstanding. Mm -hmm. um, and it has evolved with time. I'm not sure. There, there are times when it goes purely into action and away from horror. Because, again, it's hard to scare you twice. Mm -hmm. Dead Space is amazing. Yeah. Um, when I booked this game and found out that this was the creator and team that made Dead Space, I was really excited. Mm -hmm. Um, but then also, you know, like little smaller things like Outlast was really good. It's, it's really hard to say what's a favorite because with gaming, you get something different from, from different games, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but I think for longevity of, of things that I have played for a very long time, it's probably the Resident Evil franchise. That's fair. Um, I've, I'm a huge alien simp. 
I love I love Alien to my core. I've always I Alien Isolation was my first real video game. I I never had a real console since the Wii. And Wow. Uh, yeah, and uh my parents were like they they weren't anti video game cuz they grew mm-hmm. up playing video games my mom when she found out that i liked doom got mm-hmm. real excited because she remembers going to my dad's stepdad's <laughs> place and playing on his old computer the original and she was so excited to hear that i was playing the new one um but the alien isolation was what convinced me to buy my own newer console to be able to catch up on that stuff and really? man, it did not disappoint. It was, it, and I'm sad that it didn't disappoint because the studio's gone. They don't have the rights to Alien anymore. The team's disbanded. Like half of them are at, sadly passed. And it's like, we're never going to get something as well done as that. At least not until decades later when we get a new, like when history repeats itself and we get the new brilliant team that does the same thing. Uh, with the same IP with a different story, but like we we're sadly never gonna get a sequel to that. But I I loved it, and that's that holds a special place. And then of course, Evil Dead was just the run and gun shooter. Had a good time. That new game <laughs> made me lose my mind, and I had way too much fun with it. So <laughs> yeah. But with respect to Alien, there's always going to be developers out there that want to make a game around Aliens. Mm -hmm. Uh, The property is just too good. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm with you in that it is a shame that there wasn't more Alien Isolation because that game was the first in a long time where I played with a sense of dread. Mm -hmm. Um, It had been a long time and I've been playing uh, video games, I would say my whole life. I, I was not allowed to own a video game console when I was very young. Um, my mother was one of those people that I, video games are rot your brain. Yeah. Um, yeah. She's English, so she doesn't actually sound like that. But <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I went to my friend's house to play, you know, Atari and Nintendo, uh, in television, um, and all of those things. So um, I have a long history of gaming. Alien Isolation was, yeah, I just felt so uncomfortable playing that game mm-hmm. in all the right ways. Um, and I don't think that's gone unnoticed in the, the universe of video games. People know that. And so the things that worked in there, you start to see in other games, Mm -hmm. uh, the, the mood, the environment, the lighting, there are some basic tenets of horror, Mm -hmm. um, and they're used very well there. And, and so I think we'll see it come back around again with, with newer generations. Yeah. And, uh, and the new devs are getting it right. Thank, thankfully, because they did. They did Alien Isolation, and then after that was this weird hiatus of either not making an Aliens game, or when we did make an Aliens game, they made uh, Blackout, which was mm-hmm. one that it, it that was like the start of my channel was Blackout. It was it, the hype behind that name was a big deal because mm-hmm. at the time the rumor was it was going to be like an MMO shooter like Aliens Online, and it was going to be mm-hmm. crazy. Instead, it was a mobile Five Nights at Freddy's ripoff. <laughs> that, that unfortunately that was that very tragically was supposed to be a canon sequel to isolation like it had they brought really? amanda ripley in you were playing as ripley and you were still it was the same voice actress and they used the character models from isolation and it was just bad it just went it was so wrong there wasn't as much love like it was a lot of microtransactions yeah. and a lot of junk and then so i was like okay we're not gonna get another you know alien game that that's good in a minute and then i found uh cold iron studios these guys and mm-hmm. they're they're so sweet they're so nice like, <laughs> like I, I reached out to them immediately like i found one of the devs on twitter and i was like hey uh i know that you guys are working on an aliens game still i know everybody thought it was going to be blackout but they were wrong uh what is it and they were and they were like hey we watch your channel we love you and like, like, like and I, I was losing it and i was so happy to hear that and uh they nailed it when they released fire team elite uh it was a experience like no it made me feel that same dread that i felt in isolation it made me feel like i was doing the same thing over again the only difference was i had a big old smart gun mowing everything down and that felt so satisfying but uh (laughs) the the they're getting it right now and they're making these new games there's dark descent coming out that's supposed to be like 
when someone dies, they're perma dead. So it's mm. like there's going to be consequences, and th- those kinds of games are like really exciting for me. So hearing that they're fixing it is great, especially because it's Disney. Because that scared me when I heard that they bought Alien. I didn't want to see uh, I didn't want to see Princess Jasmine running around in a in an Alien. Wow, well, Disney owns everything these days, so <laughs> you know, they're not Disney fying it just right. because they. Yeah, thank God. Because I I remember Prey. I heard that they they said they were gonna make it like PG thirteen or something like that, and I was gonna be so sad because I was like, no, all the other ones have been R. What have you done? And then it came out, and I was like, this feels so much better. That that's, I trust you now. Like, because <laughs> the whole time they're they're like Alien, Predator. That's ours. Like Avatar, they already had, and mm-hmm. X Men made sense because that's you know that's Fox and that's Marvel, so it makes sense for them to own that. They're they're getting the rest of their collection together, but. The, when they got Alien and Predator, I was like, "Uh oh, like, like, what? Are, why? They're not going to touch it." Was my main fear was they were going to leave it alone and they were just going to let it be. And I knew they wouldn't do that because they're a corporation and everybody needs a lot of something. Uh, but yeah. the my fear was like they're either going to not touch it because it's such a hard R property, like you have things blowing out of people's chests. No one's going to take their kid to go see that. Uh, yeah, that's than- kind of the basic of the the canon yeah and uh and the you you're either not going to take your kid to go see that so that's not disney and or, <laughs> or, or you're or you're just uh you're going to try to disney fight you're going to make it simpler and easier to watch and no one's going to be happy with it because it's going to be nothing like what it was and then they uh-huh. made, then they made prey and all of my fear went away and I felt way better because that, that means that they're leaving it. They they just own the rights. They're leaving it to other people to do the right thing. And that felt so satisfying. And Fede Alvarez is going to do a fantastic job with his new movie. And I, I'm so happy for that. But um, I I will go ahead. I, I went on a very big ramble. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but uh, um, Ranting about aliens is a good thing. It's a good thing. <laughs> Um, but as a final question, a fun question, um, if you were, if you were stuck in black iron prison yourself, uh, like as, uh, Zeke Alton, uh, maybe on the cell next to Elias or Jacob, who would you trust to tag along with? Like if you had to go with one of them and, uh, how long do you think you'd make it through? Uh, first, that's not a fun question. That's an awful thought. (laughs) (laughs) Um, What's interesting about that kind of situation is that uh, I'm a pretty tough dude. Mm -hmm. I spent 20 years in the military, Mm -hmm. uh, but I wouldn't last five minutes in black iron prison. (laughs) Um, I guess. Okay. So if I had to think about it, I would fight against the things that make the basic tenets of survival horror. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, What makes good survival horror? Claustrophobia Mm -hmm. would not be, crawling through crawl spaces. Um, Isolation is very important. Um, So I would keep the group together. I would do anything to keep the group together. I want uh, Elias there and Jacob there and Danny there because they all have a purpose. They all need to be there in order to get um, off. But that whole trope of let's split up um, around the monsters is something that I would be like, hey, uh, nope. Uh, (laughs) I'm going going with somebody. I'm, you Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, and, and, uh, I, I would rely on Elias to get us where we need to go, Mm -hmm. um, and probably use Danny as our security along the way. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd probably feed Jacob to the monsters first, to be honest, (laughs) but, uh, (laughs) But we do need him to, well, actually, you know what? We would need him to fly off planet, but I myself am a pilot, so I think I could figure it out. He'd be yeah. the one we could lose. Yeah. So. <laughs> I, I, I got to say, out of all the characters, I hated Karen's so much. And I don't know if that was intended, I like because that's what I, what I said in my review was, like, I love her. I love uh-huh. Karen. I love Kimiko. I love the performance. I love that she played this character in this game. I wanted to use the grip and just throw her into the nearest spike every time, especially when Elias died and she's just like, I told you that I was like, God, I, I want to, I, and it makes me feel good that a game can make me 
hate somebody like that because that that's good writing and that's good acting is is i need to believe or feel something for this character i went to go see um avatar the new one mm -hmm. and as much as it was beautiful cinematically like all the shots are great the cgi is amazing i couldn't follow the plot for my for the life of me i didn't know where that was going and all and a lot of the character i didn't feel anything for a lot like i my my girlfriend was sitting next to me she was watching she's very invested in avatar she watched mm -hmm. the whole director's cut of the first one and she's excited for the director's cut of this of this one so she was crying there were a lot of moments where it was very emotional for her i'm just sitting there like what who I, like, I had no attachment. And, uh, mm -hmm. and so every character in this game I felt attached to. Even Ferris. Ferris scared me. Like, mm -hmm. like watching his uh, performance, Sam's performance as uh, um, Ferris was really intimidating, really terrifying. But, um, God, I I hated Danny. I And when I found out that you were gone and like my body realized, like, he's gone, I'm stuck with her now. <laughs> I, I, I was like, okay, I hope she comes around. And she she came around in the sense of, like, I'm not, we're, we're in this together kind of thing. But she never got nicer. So it, mm -hmm. I never could get over, like, my hate for her. But at the same time, I, I hope that, like, I hope that the DLC keeps following Jacob. Because uh, I, I, I love Jacob, and I loved Ferris, and I loved Elias. But if I have to play as Danny... I'm going to have this nagging thing in the back of my head that's just like, you. <laughs> like, like... There's, a lot to, there's a lot to that character in her backstory that explains why she is the way she is. Right. And I've heard Glenn Schofield say this, and Chris Stone say this, and a lot of other people say this, in that horror doesn't work without the humanity. Mm -hmm. So any story... Mm. be it a horror story, be it a comedy, be it a, a romance, be it an action film. It doesn't work unless you can relate to the characters. Right. Um, some of the best, you know, villains and antagonists in entertainment are people that are relatable. Right. And that's what, that's what sort of draws you to them. And that's, you know, a, a really good actor can make you despise them. Mm. You know, um, that, that, that's the hallmark of a really good job of a performer and a writing team and everybody putting that together, um, which is so amazing for a character like Danny because it's because Karen is such a, a wonderful individual. Mm -hmm. um, if you've ever seen uh, Kipo in the Age of the Wonder Beasts, yes, uh, that's much more like her personality. Mm -hmm. um, but then she's such a good performer that she can really make you hate her. Yeah. Like you are, I want to punch you in the face. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so I, I like that. I mean, that's one of the fun things about doing this job mm -hmm. is that you do get to, to be different people and do different things and really just dive in and invest in relationships and humanity and, and what it is to, because I mean, we're on a space moon with bacterial monsters and this and that, but it really comes down to the relationships of the characters and the arc of what they're going through and how we as people can actually relate to that. Mm -hmm. Like it sucks to be called out on something that you feel that you didn't do. Yeah. You know, that's Jacob's problem. But at the end of the day, no one's free of guilt. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the lessons that he needs to learn. And the actions that he has done in the past that meant nothing to him destroyed the lives of people like Danny. Yeah. So, um, Stories are great that way. I mean, it's why I'm an actor because I love to tell stories. Yeah. So it, it was amazing, it, it, and that's very well put because uh, that that's why I still like her, even though I hated her character. Was like I know that all of that hate is coming from this. Like the flashback scene was enough to tell me like that means something to her to cause such a vendetta. It's like uh, it's uh, the way I always compare those kinds of characters is like V from V for Vendetta, mm -hmm. how, how he went through something so bad that like the rest of the world looks at like, are you crazy? Like, what are you doing? But he sees it as like, this is justice. This is, I'm doing this because I need to. And, mm -hmm. uh, Danny had that same relatability, that same vibe. And all the whole game just felt like this thing of like, you need to accept that life uh, you need to accept that life has consequences and you need to accept that you 
cause some of those consequences so what intentionally or not it happens yeah. and and you can't go on like you can't pretend that it doesn't or it like if you're unaware that's one thing like you know jacob the way he lands he's uh, he has no idea what's going on or anything like he has no absolutely no clue why this is happening at first but when he starts realizing what's happening he starts realizing it is his fault and these are his actions. These are his consequences. He goes through such a change, especially towards the end, that was like mm -hmm. so gripping. And it it just fascinates me that you know, video games as a media. I always I always say that they're one of the best storytellers because they like they're a harder. I I compare them as like a harder storyteller than movies or books because books you write it down and people read it and they feel it and that's great movies you're experiencing it visually which is another sense and different and so that grips you a bit more than a book but a video game the whole point of that is to make you you're the story you're the guy going through and and you need to feel like this story matters to you and there are a lot of games that fail at that completely and Callisto was one of the very few that succeed so well at it you know mm -hmm. and I really appreciate that whole game i appreciate everything that the devs did at striking distance i appreciate everything you guys did uh that there are a lot of games that i've bought that i'd end i'd be like okay cool and then move on and this game i just i think about it all the time it's such a great game and it, i didn't made that impression that's awesome yeah it, it's 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 just unique it, it, and i remember laughing so hard because one of the biggest complaints i heard about the game was the lack of variety and enemies you know you're seeing a lot of the biophage and most of them are the same i laughed so hard because e this isn't like there are games where it's comically crazy like left for dead is comically crazy the enemy variety you have a lot of these varieties that are just because the game is a fun one and you want to make it fun but for the sake of a story i'm not going to watch walking dead and expect like a zombie T-Rex to come out of the corner of the screen as like a as like a boss fight for the show. Uh, I'm not going to expect that because that's not important. I'm not supposed to I'm not supposed to see a ton of variety, especially if it's a disease like this one like the biophage where it's a single strand going around infecting a lot of the same things. Uh, mm -hmm. you're going to run into the same stuff and that shouldn't be a complaint. That should be a respect to the authenticity respect to the plot because mm -hmm. the minute that like you know ferris was the alpha so his expansion into that thing at the end was like understandable it, he he's the new leader of the charge but if i had seen anything prior to like the twins you know the twins was like the craziest of the enemy types yet mm -hmm. still very realistic to what the disease could do if I saw mm -hmm. anything crazier than the twins, I probably would have lost connection or a touch with the game because it, it mm -hmm. would have been too much and too over the top. So I got to give credit to striking distance in terms of knowing where to quit on how crazy the enemy types can be, because there are so many different games that like, yes, they are crazy. It's fun, but it, you don't need that to tell a good story. And a lot of people skip well that. And I will give credit to Krafton mm. for allowing Glenn and his team to make the game they wanted to make. Mm -hmm. That's a really bold thing to do in today's economic environment to say, here's a creative idea that I have, and I want to get somebody to fund it without taking executive notes. Right. Uh, because, you know, I think everyone's quick to complain about uh, movies and TV shows and how they tend to get watered down by executive notes and everybody has their hand in the pot, which turns it into something that that lacks singular focus. And this is one time where the creative team was allowed to do exactly what they wanted to do up until the point to where when they were asked to tone it down for release in Japan, they were able to say no. Yeah. They gave up millions of dollars mm -hmm. by not releasing this in Japan, which is a major video game market because Glenn Schofield and his team was allowed to stick to their vision of what they wanted to do. Now, you can like it, you can you can hate it. That's a matter of opinion, which is art. Um, but you have to respect the idea that the person has a vision, that the team has a vision, and then they're able to, to see that vision through, work years on something, and then give it to you. 
and it works as a game that gives you agency, that puts you in a world and an environment that you can care about and have fun with and be scared by and all those wonderful things mm -hmm. that this does. So, you know, it may seem a little hokey and all kumbaya hands together, but again, this is, this is why I do this job because I love that about it. And, and like I said previously, no one's holding a gun to anyone's head saying you must be a video game maker. Yeah. Um, we're here because we love to do this. We love to make these things. Um, so I, I, you know, I'm excited to see, see the next iteration, what comes next. Yeah. I'm stoked. I, I'm excited to see it too. Uh, thank you so much for doing this interview. I'm really happy uh, with how it, cause just like how you love what, what you do as a, as a voice actor and actor, uh, th this is what I want to do. You know, I work part-time as a cook just because I need to pay the bills and, you know, YouTubing doesn't make a lot of money. But, as an actor, I understand that. Yeah, <laughs> but, but, uh, the, this right here, the interaction with people and, and hearing stories that you don't hear all the time. Like, you know, you, people will see this on YouTube and be like, Hey, I saw that on YouTube, but, the, but for me, I, I can't look this up, this right mm -hmm. here. I can't, I can't look it up and I can't, uh, I can't try to see like, Oh, I'm just going to watch it at home. I'm going to like I, it for me, it's the experience. It's making me feel like, uh, talking to people. It always makes me feel like I'm connecting and, uh, it makes me feel happy. It makes me, this is what I want to do interviewing people is what I want to do. And, That's awesome. Yeah. Well, we're community animals as human beings. So mm -hmm. connection is important. We all learned that over the pandemic. Connection is very important. Yeah. So, uh, But thank you so much for your time. And I really appreciate everything that you said. And I, I appreciate just your performance. And yeah, just thank you so much. I, I really, I can't thank you enough. Well, thanks for having me, Carter. And I wish you the best of luck. And I can't wait to see the next interview that you do. All right. Have Thanks. You too. See ya.